This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're so thankful for those of you who joined us in person this morning. It's good to see your lovely faces this morning. And those of you who are watching from home, we'd like to welcome you also. We'd like for those of you who are here in person this morning to please complete the Connect cards, fill these out, place them in the basket on your way out the door. That way we have a record of your attendance. If you're watching from home, please go to www.fumctupelo.com backspace I'm here to register your attendance. I'd like to share a few announcements with you this morning. The first is that we're looking for volunteers. Church is always looking for volunteers, but this time we're looking for volunteers to relate to our core values. And this morning our emphasis is on Christian education. There should be a card like this in your order of service. If not, the ushers can give you one. If you can complete these and turn these in on your way out the door, we would appreciate it. Again, if you're watching from home, you may go to our website and go to www.fumctupelo.com backspace connect, and you may be able to, you may fill out the card there. In addition, this morning, I'd like to remind those of you who are here that Habitat for Humanities met on last week for an interest session, and as a result, we'll have a Habitat work day for our members on the 17th of this month, the 17th of this month. And please don't forget, if you're here, you didn't forget, that we have changed locations for our traditional worship services. The 845 traditional worship service meets in the gathering room. The 11 o'clock worship service meets here in Wesley Hall. And these are just a few of the things that are happening in the life of our church. Let us prepare now our hearts and souls and minds for worship as, we share, as I share the centering words with you this morning. Bless, Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for, you, for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 
We lift up our souls to you, holy God. Teach us, Lord, that we may know your ways. Let us worship the one who leads us in what is right. Together, let us worship Let's pray. Gracious God, eternal God, you've led us to curiosity about our creation, ourselves, and all things unknown. God of Abraham and Sarah, you led us to new understandings when we least expect them. Let us never see ourselves as too young, too old, or too wise to learn new lessons from you. God of the prophets, you call us to speak truth with love to a reluctant world. Give us courage to judge ourselves and wisdom to learn from those you send to teach us. 
God of the rich, younger ruler, you love us, though we shrink from the challenge of discipleship. Lead us to surrender our own wills, that we might seek yours, and draw closer to your grace. Everlasting, ever-loving God, teacher, creator, giver of knowledge and freedom, fear and courage, doubt and faith. Grant that we might always use your gifts to the world for peace, justice, love, and hope, and make the wisdom of the Amen. May be seated. At this time, Dustin Markle will come, who's our chair of Christian formation and share a Christian education witness. Good morning, everybody. Um, sorry about the glare. Um, <laughs> these lights are bright. That's okay. My grandma said God only made a few perfect heads, and the rest he covered with hair. So, but um, if you don't know me, my name's Dustin Markle. My wife Mary and my daughters Caroline and Sadie and I have been members here for uh, about six years. My daughters were baptized by Reverend Britton. Um, we've enjoyed being a part of this church and the community. And um, as members of the church, pretty soon after we joined, I was recruited to a committee because we're Methodists. Um, and since I actually went to the committee meetings, they nominated me for chairperson. <laughs> And so I've been chair of the Christian Formation Committee for two years. Um, and uh, our goal with that has been to hopefully promote Christian education and Christian formation programs throughout the church, uh, facilitating the needs of our members to grow in that area. Um, Isaiah 118 says, come now, let us reason together. And um, I think, and the, and the committee exists because we have the privilege and the obligation as followers of Christ to uh, take the word of God given to us uh, very seriously. Uh, we're called to lifelong learning by studying his word. And in the invitation, I pointed out that as long as you're not Tom Wicker, you've got something else to learn from the Bible. Um, <laughs> We, we deepen our faith and understanding of who God is and who we are by taking those steps and being dedicated to study his word both individually and with other believers. So um, while not a complicated idea, the gospel is by no means simple, and it takes study and effort to realize the depth and the width and the beauty of the gospel and to aptly make it part of our daily lives to be the body of Christ in our world. Um, our church offers many opportunities to gather together to study his word and grow as believers. We have Sunday school classes for the very, very young all the way to the very old. Um, most of those are separated by age, but Smith and I lead a class where all ages are welcome if you choose not to associate with people your age. Um, our men's small group is meeting at 6 a.m. on Wednesdays. Our women's small groups are meeting. Uh, we have Refresh that's restarted on Wednesday night where the pastors are leading three separate Bible studies there on different topics. Um, the youth are meeting and worshiping, I think, on Sunday evenings. And um, Carla has about five activities a day for the kids um, if you need, need more opportunity there. Uh, she does a really great job in engaging our children and, and planting those seeds that are so important. But I'd like to conclude by thanking you for your support and uh, your participation in your own Christian education and, and formation. I'd like to encourage you and challenge you to, over the next year, possibly find something new uh, that you can contribute to and benefit from. If you have ideas for something that the church is not uh, offering, Smith will be happy to make that happen for you. Um, but 
I've been encouraged by participating in Sunday school and small groups over the past few years and have really felt a, a renewed excitement for studying the Word of God. And um, I'm thankful that our church has, has renewed that in me, and I hope that that'll happen for you too. Let's pray together. Be our vision, O God, and open our eyes and our hearts to your holy scriptures, that as your scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we would receive with joy uh, what you speak to us today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scriptures today are from Jeremiah, or excuse me, from Deuteronomy 6, uh, beginning with uh, verse 1, and then we'll have uh, Psalm 25. Uh, hear the word with me. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you were about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. And talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let's hear and say together Psalm 25. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. 
According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and testimonies. Amen. Well, I have to tell you all, um, I have noticed something uh, about my family this week. Uh, In particular, I've noticed something about my children uh, that I did not previously recognize. My children prefer sun butter to peanut butter. Now, do you all know what sun butter is? I see a few parents with a look of recognition here. I was, we were, you know, some late night and we'd been busy and I, we were having one of those peanut butter sandwich supper nights, right? And so I was making some peanut butter sandwiches and I'd gotten out, or was about to, and I'd gotten out all the stuff. I'd gotten out the, you know, the, the creamy jiff, the good stuff. And I had my knife so I could cut off the crust as per the requests. And I'm getting ready to make it. And one of my daughters says, Daddy, don't use the peanut butter. I need you to use the sun butter. Now, I thought that I was offering them the good stuff, right? Sun butter is a pale imitation of the glories of peanut butter. But they wanted the sun butter. And why? Because every day when I send them to school, they go with the sun butter sandwich. We've tried other things, but we really can't settle on anything else. And more days than not, in fact, almost every day, they're having a sun butter or sun butter and jelly sandwich. If you don't know, sun butter is sort of like peanut butter, but it's made out of sunflower seeds instead of peanuts. And it's helpful for uh, kids who have peanut allergies. And so when you send stuff to school these days, you need to make sure that we're taking care of our neighbors who might have, who can be really, really severe allergies, so you don't send nut products. You use, if you want to have a peanut butter sandwich, sun butter. So day after day after day, going to school, my girls have gone with all of their other stuff, healthy and unhealthy, and a sun butter sandwich. For them, that's the real deal. Peanut butter is some pale imitation that you might get on the weekend, an ersatz version of the glories of sun butter. Um, totally opposite of what I would have expected. They have been formed over these days, uh, over all of their lunches. They have inwardly digested, to use the words of the prayer uh, about Holy Scripture that we used a little while ago, or that we prayed a little while ago. They have inwardly digested that this is the real deal. We are being formed by the things that we participate in, in the daily patterns of our lives, in all kinds of ways that we, of which we are aware and unaware, we are being formed day by day. There are things that we are observing and hearing and keeping up with, reciting, to use, talking about, to use all of the language of Deuteronomy 6. And those things are transforming our hearts, our imaginations, our very lives. In the passage that we read from Deuteronomy, uh, it's helpful to know a bit of the context, and you may have glimpsed this in the passage itself. Uh, The context is that the people of God, Israel, who God has raised up out of slavery in Egypt, are soon to enter into the promised land. This has been a very difficult journey for them. For 40 years, they've been in the wilderness. A few chapters before, God has told them that you were finally, you're about to go into the promised land, and they have hedged once again, and finally, we're really about to go this time. This is a people who have been forgetful, willful, recalcitrant, distracted from all of the ways that God would have them to live, even after God has raised them out of Egypt. But now God's promises are going to be fulfilled. They are at last going to enter into the promised land. And God's promise for them is that in that land they will thrive if they will be the kind of people that God has created them to be. A people who hear the message of the one God and who love that God with all of their heart, uh, with all of their soul, and with all of their of their might. And this opening passage uh, to what will be a development of all of the laws that they will need to abide by in the promised land is sort of a, a summary of that mission and vision for the people of God as they go into the land 
that God has promised. And this passage uh, contains one of those important scriptures of all of the Old Testament, a prayer called the Shema. It is the passage that begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Now this is like the essential prayer of the people of Israel. Uh, Jews pray this prayer multiple times a day in the same way that Christians tend to pray the Lord's Prayer all the time if we're following sort of our set patterns of prayer. This, is, this prayer is like that for faithful Jews. They pray it again and again and again. And the, the title of this prayer that, that, we, that we use, the Shema, it comes from that very first word in the prayer. Hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is alone. Now, the kind of hearing that we're talking about isn't just when, you know, sound waves hit your eardrum and it does whatever it does in there to transmit it to your brain. Uh, I think most of us have experienced that we can hear but not really hear, right? We can hear but not really listen. The kind of hearing that uh, we're talking about here, the way that this word gets used in the Old Testament, it's not just, you know, the transmission of sound waves. It is the kind of hearing that calls our deep attention. Hear, listen up, this is what you need to know. It's the kind of hearing that calls for attention and then action in response to what we have heard. If you've really heard, then it does something to you. You begin to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and to do all these things that will follow on and discuss. The kind of hearing that we're talking about is a transformational hearing. Now, pay attention to the verbs in this passage. They tell us a little bit about what it really is for us to hear from God. Now, we could back up to the beginning of Deuteronomy 6, and we'll pick up on a few hints even there. You'll hear the words teach, observe, cross into, occupy, fear, keep, then hear and observe, again, multiply. Now, this is the commandment, the statues and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all these days of your life and keep all his decrees and commandments that I'm commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. The, the verbs here indicate an all-encompassing kind of hearing, a hearing that results in teaching and observation and a thriving life together where we multiply. That culminates then in verse 4, love. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God. How? with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It is a hearing that results in an all-encompassing transformation of who we are. And what that looks then like uh, is this, that we will keep those words that I am commanding you uh, in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them while you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. The, the The hearing results in a love that transforms the way that they live. They're going to keep these words. They're going to recite them. In Sunday school a little while ago, someone, it may have been Stuart McMillan, but sorry if I'm crediting you wrongly or missing someone out, Uh, Their translation said to impress. It's like we're stamped with this. Then uh, we are bound by it. It's fixed on us. It results in 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 a transformation of our entire pattern of life. Now, we could imagine a kind of way of doing that that's a kind of lip service, right? Uh, We could emblazon a T-shirt with a Bible verse. We could put WWJD on a bracelet, and we have sort of attached ourselves to these images, and maybe or maybe it doesn't transform us. Now, I'm not against t-shirts. We have some great church t-shirts and and, and things like that. So I'm not saying that those things are bad, but we could do that in kind of a superficial way. That's not what Deuteronomy has in mind. 
This is a deep transformation, a hearing that results in an immersion in the Word of God, in the world of God, in the vision of God for God's people. It's not in one ear and out the other. It's hearing that makes us who we are. Now, there are all kinds of things out there that are competing for our hearing, that are competing for our attention and even for our love. We are formed day by day by the patterns of our life, whether it is the sun butter sandwich that we're eating in the school uh, cafeteria day by day or the pattern of our life and work together. Those things slowly form us over time into the people that we are. And we could point to how that happens in all kinds of ways in our life, but it is uh, just striking to me that we, media in particular wants to call our attention in those ways, right? The kinds of news programming that we watch, no matter what your preferred you know, cable channel of choice is, right? It wants to form you in a particular pattern of thought. Social media works that way as well. It wants to call your attention to it again and again and again. There is no end to the number of images, the number of messages and posts that you could see. Uh, And that way, it's different than reading a newspaper or a book. When you're done with it, you put it down and you're done. But there's no end to the Facebook feed. They know that. Uh, And their algorithms are set up to call your attention continually back to it. And this can result in some truly harmful things. Uh, We have encountered that a little bit this week. Uh, At the beginning of the week, you may have heard the news about a whistleblower from Facebook who described how they have recognized that their algorithms, the way that posts appear on your Facebook feed, uh, are cultivated in such a way to continue to get your attention and to be divisive. The more divisive things are, the more attention uh, is drawn to it, and so the more those things are elevated. There's also news this week that uh, internal studies of, uh, from Instagram have shown that one-third of teenage girls who are using Instagram report that the platform has made them feel worse about their body image. Right? The way, the kind of media, the kind of attention that is cultivated can result in very much harmful things. Now, I'm not saying not to use social media. Hi out there to everybody on Facebook. It's good to see you, right? I I will post uh, some pictures on Facebook this afternoon. I'm not saying that social media is uh, off limits for Christian by no means. But I am saying that we should be aware that our attention as Christians is being cultivated by the different things that we encounter in our life. And if we want to be formed as Christians, we have to be formed by the things of God on a continual basis, to be educated, to be changed, to be immersed in the world of God's love for us that calls us to love God. In a little while, we'll sing from uh, Take My Life and Let It Be. One of the things that we'll say is, take my, or sing, is take my life and let it be. Uh, consecrated unto thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. To be cultivated, to hear the things of God is to have our lives transformed, not by just whatever comes our way, but transformed in an intentional way, in a way that surrenders our lives to the God who would change our hearts. You see, we're called not just to hear. Here is the second most important verb in this passage, but into a hearing that leads us into the most important verb in this passage, which is to love. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Our hearing is directed toward shaping us in the love of God. And some of you may be familiar with something called the general rules. The general rules were uh, a list of things that John Wesley gave the early Methodists to shape their imaginations about what it is to live a faithful Christian life. You may know sort of the reduced version of that. You've probably heard that before. That We are called to 
uh, first to do good, uh, to do no harm, and then to attend upon the ordinances of God, or as some people have uh, sort of tried to translate that, is to, uh, to stay in love with God. I prefer uh, attend upon the ordinances of God. It's a little more specific. Well, one of the things that Wesley says in the section about doing no harm is that we should, uh, at that time they didn't have social media, but we did have songs and books. Or he says to sing only those songs and read only those books that tend toward the knowledge and love of God. I don't want to hold that over us in a super legalistic way, but I think it helps maybe shape our imaginations, right? We are going to encounter all kinds of things that would call uh, our attention to this or that pattern of life. But for us, we're called uh, to dwell on those things, to be formed by those things that lead us into the knowledge and the love of God. Notice it's more than just knowledge. It is love. It's not mere affection either. It's love that binds the whole thing together so that we become who we love. The vision of Deuteronomy is the, a people who are, are so in love with God that it characterizes everything that they do when they lie down and when they get up when they're going on their way, when they're entering into their doors, when they're talking with their children, that it comes to characterize everything, all that they are. This vision is uh, paired with another vision that we could, we could go to in, uh, in Jeremiah 31. And in fact, it's more than a vision. It is a promise of what God will do for God's people. This is what Jeremiah 31 says. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. That's talking about that Deuteronomy 6 is calling us back to that. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they say to each other, or shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We stand between those two ends. The, the call to live as those who are teaching the word of God to each other and abiding in that. But we do that in a way where we are hoping for the time when God writes his law on our heart. Uh, we, as Methodist Christians, believe that God's love can be given to us in such a way that even in this life, we can truly and fully love God so that we can become that which we have taken in by the gift of God. Now, you probably all know this already, but you all know why fl uh, flamingos are pink, right? Flamingos are pink because they eat brine shrimp uh, that are pink. They are pink because... They eat these al this algae, and apparently the flamingos also eat this algae that's full of uh, carotenoid pigments that turn the shrimp pink, the algae pink, and the flamingos pink. They become that which they have inwardly digested to go back to the prayer. And so, too, God would have us so abide in his love that we become like God. Jesus didn't come in the flesh so that we could have interesting information about God. He came in the flesh so that we could become the children of God and be the kind of people that God has called us to be. And in this mission and vision emphasis that you've already heard, and Christian education emphasis that you've already heard about today from Dustin, we have all kinds of opportunities for us as a church to deeply abide in the kinds of formation that God would have for us, where we uh, learn and grow in God's love, where we anticipate the new covenant that's written on our hearts so that uh, our, not only our minds are developed, but our hearts are changed. A uh, theologian, James K.A. Smith, uh, in his book, You Are What You Love, puts it this way. Jesus is a teacher who doesn't just inform our intellect, but our very loves. He isn't uh, content simply to deposit new ideas into your mind, he is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, and your longings. 
if you, and I see so many of you out here who I've seen in Sunday school classes and on Wednesday nights uh, and in small groups and other opportunities, uh, I have a promise for you. If you go to those things and abide in them, inwardly digest them, or if you aren't already plugged in and you plug into some of these things, you will grow as a Christian. God in Christ and through the Holy Spirit will meet you there so that your faith will grow and so that you will more deeply love God. Um, I've seen it again and again. I've seen people grow in this church, grow in their understanding of their faith, grow as teachers. If you come, if you participate, you will be formed and you will meet the God who comes to us in Jesus and is with us in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. We hear from God. We hear in such a way that it uh, becomes how we love and becomes the very essence of who we are. On Tuesday, not tomorrow because school's off tomorrow, yay. Um, uh, Ember, I don't know if I'm making that meeting. Um, uh, On Tuesday, I will get up, I will stretch, I'll get some coffee, and I will begin to make some sun butter sandwiches and send my girls off to school. If they're lucky, they might have a cosmic brownie that day. Um, there will definitely be uh, some fruit snacks, and I'll cut up some apples, right? I will make their lunch, and it will nourish them on the way. And it will cultivate the very things that they identify with care, with love, with who they are, and what it means to have a good meal, to be taken care of. And tomorrow you will wake up. In fact, after this service, you will go out. And some of those things will come for you as well. You will be uh, formed in particular ways uh, by the media that we take in, uh, whether it's on television or on social media, by just the very patterns of life that we live in our world and this community. None of those things are, I'm not saying that any of those things are necessarily bad. But for us as Christians... The promise is that we can be formed not just by those things that are coming our way, but by the very love of God that meets us in our daily life and in all things, but also in the ways that we as a church intend to focus and cultivate that hearing and that love and that very becoming of who God would have us to be. May it be so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
May be seated. After hearing the word, let us now respond. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you for guiding us with wisdom so that we may know the way we should go. How sweet are your words of life, O God, sweeter than honey. We praise you for the good news you bring us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the women and men to whom you have given gifts for teaching and leading. May you bless them abundantly, O God, and increase their joy as they serve you. May we all continue to grow in faith, hope, and love as Christ's disciples. God, give us together as the church where each person is loved by the Lord. Help us to share faithfully Jesus as we participate in your kingdom drawing near. Let us bow our heads, please. Almighty and everlasting God, come now. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Touch us and remind us of the words that we've heard from Scripture and the words we've heard and the message today and words we've heard in song. Remind us, dear God, that you are God who teaches us to be formed by your word and by your deeds. So often, dear God, we are formed by other things, as Smith said this morning, but we ask and pray that we would have your word as the essential for our lives. Teach us, dear God, to read our scriptures, to pray, to love one another, and to do all that we can to make this world what you would have it to be. For thy kingdom come indeed. We ask, dear God, that you would bring an end to this virus. Heal those that are sick and shut in. Bring peace to a war-torn world where there's division. We ask for unity. We ask and pray, dear God, that you would teach us to obey all of your commandments and to do as you would have us to do. And now, dear God, with the confidence of your children, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite the ushers to come forward as we invite you to give back to God as God has so graciously given unto us. Amen.
us pray. Lord, we thank you for our pastors and teachers who nourish us spiritually. We thank you for each member who uses their gifts to bless others. Offer our tithes and offerings to you to support the ministries of this church in our community and worldwide. Amen. I invite you now uh, to uh, hear how God is speaking to you, uh, to transform your loves, to transform uh, the very essence of who you are. Uh, as we sing our closing hymn, if you would like to spend some time in prayer, it's a little easier to do it in here in some ways. We have kneelers that are all around the room. If you'd like to, feel free to go and kneel and pray there. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, you can catch my attention or Embra's, and we will gladly go do that uh, as well. Let us sing together our hymn of gratitude. Brothers and sisters in Christ, here you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, and with all your, stro- your soul, and with all your might. May you now go forth and love to show the world what it is to experience the love of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.